All right. We're going to try and slog through this as best we can. Um, and, you know, there's some insignificant changes, and then there's some that are more thought-provoking. Um, first off, right at the top, you'll see date prepared. And what that just means is, the, obviously, the date that you're preparing it. We used to, the contract used to say, this is an offer, buy in between, and dated such and such a date. And this way, they're showing you exactly what date this offer is being prepared. So, there is, so you can have all of your deadlines running the way you want to. For example, if you extend the offer, you want to know when the offer expires. But you want to make sure that, because we oftentimes have contracts that are prepared, and then they send out another contract, and we want to know the date that it's prepared. So let's not spend a lot of time on this. Um, paragraph 1E, you will notice that they've added language, brokers are not parties to this agreement. We all know that the real estate agents are not parties to the contract, but it was kind of buried in the back, and so now right off the top, there it is, we're not parties to this contract. We represent the clients, and we have you know, agency relationships with our clients, the buyer, the seller, whoever, but we still are not um, parties to this contract, which means we have no rights under this contract. Our contract for commission is not subject to this purchase contract. Rather, it's we derive our right to a commission from the MLS and from the listing agreements. Uh, paragraph 2C, and Sam, if I'm going too fast, let me know. All right, sounds good, um, thanks. Paragraph 2C, Deals, it's a new, par new paragraph, and it deals with potentially competing buyers and sellers. And what this is, is that the parties acknowledge that there's um, possible represent representation of, of one buyer or seller, disclosures, consents, things like that. What that means is that, for example, if a listing agent has... Um, has a, a client that might be in the, interested in purchasing the property, they may also have presented an offer. So there might be competing, we're not necessarily talking about multiple counter offers and things like that, but there could be multiple representation by buyer and sellers. So hopefully you understand that. It's a little bit more complex, but it's kind of hard to, to describe it in this seminar at this point. Paragraph three deals with um, the deposit, and it kind of streamlines it a little bit better than it was. It deals with, we used to say what the deposit was, and there were some boxes that you could check. Now it's saying the buyers, it, it puts in buyers direct deposit directly to escrow. In, in agents who have been around for a while will remember we used to take checks from clients and put them in our escrow, you know, hold them in the box and hand them over to escrow. Um, now, this makes it a little more clear that, that the brokers are not going to be holding the deposit, that the deposits are going to go directly to the escrow, and it gives a time frame as to when they're supposed to do it, and it also adds that it can be a cashier's check or a personal check. Um, a lot of times people look at this and they say, but my client wants to wire transfer. Well, that's what the box other means. You can put wire transfer in there. Just because they have check, cashier check and personal check doesn't mean that your client can't do a wire transfer. Okay? The next paragraph, we've got a lot of different financial changes to this contract it's because a lot of the deposit language and a lot of the what do we do with the initial deposit? What do we do with increased deposit? What about cash offers? So a lot of the changes have to do with, with money. So we're going to spend a little more time on all this financing information. Um, paragraph 3, I guess semi-paragraph 2, has got some added language in it that says the deposit checks given to the agent shall be an original signed check and not a copy. For our company purposes, we don't like to accept checks from clients. We don't have client trust accounts. We don't have ways to do it. We have to take the check and then we have to walk it over to escrow. So our preference as a company is that if your client is going to be putting in an offer that you say to your client, you know, once your, you know, once your offer is accepted, you know, we need to get deposit monies and everything else strictly over there. The deposit check though, we used to have clients write checks and then we just make a copy of it and let the client hold the check. 
with the, the way they've changed the rules now is that they actually have to hand you the physical deposit check, which you will hold and you will put into your trust log in your office, um, and you can, you know, I don't know of a lot of agents who are actually walking that check along with the original offer over to the other agent, and I'm not suggesting that you have to do it. But since they're requiring original signed checks and not copies any longer, we're going to have to be ever vigilant about our trust logs and making sure that all of these checks are logged in. Um, next change is on the increased deposit. You all know that when you do an increased deposit, you've got to do an increased deposit form, etc. And this really uh, solidifies the issue regarding liquidated damages. So when you do an, uh, when you have your liquidated damages in your purchase contract, it's initialed and signed off by all the parties. If you are going to have an increase in the deposit, you have to make sure you include the form RID, which is the request for increased deposit, at the time signed by everything and delivered to escrow. So escrow knows and protects that extra money that's coming in, it is still incorporated into the liquidated damages provision. <laughs> if you don't do that form, that extra money will not be considered liquidated damages. So it's very, very important that you do that. The all cash offer box, paragraph C, has also been rewritten that to specify that no loan is needed to purchase the property. And that written verification of the funds to close the transaction has to be attached to the purchase contract or within three days or a specified amount of days. If you're going to have a lot, an all cash offer, which we're seeing a lot of all cash offers lately, um, they need to make sure that they have that verification and funds in there. There's a lot of questions that come up with um, all cash offers and whether the buyer can go ahead and get a loan. And I have agents calling me saying, well, it's an all cash offer. They can't go get a loan. That's not true. They can go get a loan, but it's not a contingency of the contract. So if they don't get a loan, it doesn't matter. That They still have to come to the closing with all cash. Um, cash offers were down to paragraph 3D. And those are just, um, I would consider them minor changes. They've added the word financing and corrected um, the name of the form. So I don't really, that doesn't really change much of anything. They just, instead of they just had conventional finance, it used to just say conventional financing, FHA, VHA, seller, and now they've just added the word that it's going to be seller financing just to make it clearer. Okay. Um, and they also added in the FHA and VA, uh, FHA, VA amendatory clause, they added that a form shall be, that form shall be incorporated into um, the agreement. And people are now starting to see a lot more VA loans coming out. At least we are down here in San Diego. I, don't, I, I haven't seen too many up in Orange County and LA yet, but we're starting to see a lot more VA loans. So we're all going to have to and that's, that might be a good seminar, uh, webinar to have, Sam, okay. in the future, is really have a short webinar on VA and what, what you need for VA loans and what you need for, what forms you need to do for a VA contract. We're on to the second page now, and we're over to paragraph J, the 3J. They've renumbered some of these paragraphs. Um, the verification, I can go back up to H, the verification of down payment. Um, the default is now three days on that. I think we already discussed this earlier. Um, there's your appraisal contingency and removal there. So you want to make sure that if it's an all cash, you want to check is you want to make sure that that is not makes it not contingency on paragraph L. Um, you see, there's a box you can check there. So make sure that when that comes back, if you're representing the listing agent and it's an all cash deal. Make sure you check that paragraph to make sure that they haven't made the sale contingent on the appraisal. Ooh, we're going all over the place here. Oh, sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, the uh, loan application, um, there's a requirement now that the buyer must within three days um, after acceptance deliver to seller verification that they've made their loan application and credit report and that, you know that type of thing if there's a specific if they specified a 
the loan, you now have to specify the terms and conditions of the loan on page one, and therefore you need to make sure that when that qualification comes in, if you're representing the seller, that it matches with what the, what the buyer had said they were going to get. Um, contingency has changed slightly. Um, there's a bit of question actually, um, why do I have, buyers are complaining, why do I have to tell my seller what kind of loan I'm getting, what, what business is of theirs, and the reason is because it's a contingency of the contract, and therefore the seller has a right to know that type of information. They don't have a right to know exactly what your credit score is or what bank accounts you have, none of that confidential information, but they have to know what the parameters are that you're getting a loan for. Um, the loan contingency, a lot of people are using the loan contingency to get out of it based on reasons that have nothing to do with the loan contingency. The buyer's qualifications for a loan are the reason for them not getting the loan. I mean, if, they, if they're not qualified for a loan, that's the legitimate reason that you should be getting from your, the list, from the selling agent, my buyer didn't qualify for a loan. And if there's if they've already if there's no appraisal contingency, then then that's not a condition of it. Um, so get them to waive their appraisal contingencies because appraisals are are not appraisals are opinions, and appraisals can vary from one place to another place, from one appraiser to another. So if you are representing the seller, the best thing to do is to try and get that appraisal, a contingency, and get it waived as soon as you can get it waived, hopefully within the 17 days. Because we're having a lot of times where the appraiser is going out you know, at the last minute and then finding out, oh, the price isn't the right price. So the, loan, the buyer would qualify for a loan, but maybe not the total amount of loan that they want to. And so they're exercising their cancellation rights because they've left that appraisal right in there to the last minute and so they're able to back out of the transactions. Now, if you're representing the buyer, that's a good thing. You want to have that in there as long as possible. I'm just going to briefly hit the lender limits on buyer's credits because we're seeing a lot of buyer's credits and that's a whole other topic. But This is a new paragraph and it limits um, the buyer's credits to whatever the lender will allow. So if the, if the agreement was for $6,000 in buyer's credits, but the lender only allows four, the buyer's only going to get four. Okay? Very good. Didn't come up with that. Not my idea, but that's the way it is. Um, next paragraph that was changed was um, paragraph K, and, and that is another new paragraph that if the buyer offer is cash and they change to a loan, we've already talked about this, so we don't need to go into that. If you look at paragraph 5, you'll see there's a lot more. Um, you'll notice one thing that's glaringly missing from that, and that is the WPA. The WPA is no longer um, part of the contract. It's no, they're not even going to be using that form anymore. Um, it's not going to be a requirement of sale, although it's never been a requirement of sale. Um, it's always been kind of custom and practice to include it. So now if, you're, if your buyer wants termite clearance or termite report, they're going to have to put that in other terms, or they're going to have to request that there be termite um, work done. And it's also further down on the inspections. So if you have any of those things, make sure you check those boxes. The buyer's inspection advisory is automatically checked. Um, the allocation of costs has somewhat stayed the same. Um, they've added language that says, it says that, you know, just because somebody is paying for the inspection doesn't mean they were paying for the work. Um, there was always some confusion. Well, they said they were going to pay for the inspection, and people were saying, but they got to pay for the work. So just make sure when you're going through this that you detail what report you want. You see there's a lot of blanks in here, so you, if you want termite work or termite clearance, you can put it in this paragraph. All right, we can move. Uh, th there's, these are, some of these are just minor changes, putting in parentheses. Uh, they've added smoke detector, who's going to pay for smoke detector, carbon monoxide devices. Uh, generally, that's the seller that does it because those are 
uh, point of sale, but as a most part, it, it really hasn't been that way. The real point of sale is the water strapping, and that's always been in there. So you can make a determination as to who's going to pay for those and whose who's responsibility it is to have them. Obviously, um, the the buyer, they've added a paragraph that says the buyer um, can it should be provided with a copy of any required point of sale inspection reports. If there's been anything done, they have to get that. Escrow and title, you have the right to put in for your escrow title. That hasn't really changed at all. The only thing that's changed is there's now a default to five days requiring um, the parties to sign, read, sign, and return the escrow um, instructions back. Um, we've had many transactions where the escrow instructions have gone out and one of the parties has sat on them and hasn't come back with the instructions. So now there's a little bit more strength to it because there's the five days. Uh, the, the other cost paragraph hasn't really changed. Although um, they have talked about now the seller is going to pay for HOA fees for for processing the documents. Um, it seems to me they've also added a section that, um, that you can select if there's additional documents that need to prepare, be prepared by the HOA, who's going to pay for those. And there's also language now that the buyer can waive a home warranty plan. Uh, I don't know why they felt the need to add this language because the buyer could always waive the right to a home warranty plan, but they've decided that's important. So. Here's an interesting question that came up that uh, might be relevant. Uh, are general provisions the same as the original escrow instructions? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, paragraph 8 has come, become a real sticking point in every transaction I see lately. What's included, what's not included. We could do a whole class on what's included and what's not included in sales. Noted. You have to be really specific when you represent the buyer and when you represent the seller as to what your client wants to leave and what your client wants to take. When your client is the buyer and they're making an offer, what do they anticipate that they're going to be getting in this property? Um, they did add, and believe it or not, I've had disputes over the gas logs and grates and fireplace inserts. So those stay. Okay. Remember that. They stay. Um, solar power systems is a big thing. We have a solar disclosure now that you guys can pull up and use. Solar is a really big issue because sometimes they're lease systems, sometimes they're not lease systems, sometimes they're finance systems. Your client as a, as a buyer may not want that solar power system because it may come with a heavy price tag. So make sure you're negotiating these, these items prior to you know, entering into the contract. Be very specific with your client. If this if this house is listed as solar powered or has there's this new program, what's it called now? It's Pace Hero, Hero and Pace, which, yeah. Which which allows for financing of all kinds of energy efficient type thing systems. So you want to make sure if any of these these things as systems or equipment are on the property that your client is purchasing or your client is selling, make sure there's full disclosure on that as to whether they have the buyer has to qualify for the financing, whether or not it's under the HERO program, which means it's incorporated into the property taxes. All of these things you need to think about because as houses become more technologically uh, advanced and, and have all these home security systems and everything else and automated systems, you have to be careful as to what comes and what doesn't come, what's leased, what's not leased. Do I have to qualify my buyer? So make sure you're really paying attention to this paragraph and, and don't believe what's on the MLS necessarily because it may say solar system included, but you need to find out what exactly inclu is included in the solar system. Um, nine, you'll see that there's a new paragraph that's added regard, well, it's modified regarding a seller remaining in possession after close of escrow. We're seeing that a lot. You have to, you know, you have to do the form that says it's the SIP form that the seller's going to stay in afterwards. If the seller's going to stay longer than 30 days, what is it? It's a lease. So seller in possession is less than 30 days. 
make sure you do that. Make sure that if you're going to do that, that there's a provision for money to be continued to held in escrow for any damages caused by the seller, or that the, that the seller provides some sort of um, assurances that there won't be any damage, because we're finding that the seller in possession is staying there for 10, 15 days, and when they move out, they tend to be taking things with them, or breaking things, or doing all kinds of things. So make sure that, that you do the separate agreement and that you spell out exactly what the terms are for them staying in possession. In paragraph 10, they've just added some language, you know, there isn't a lot, just more um, clarification of, of items. Next, we're at the statutory disclosures. There's been some, some changes. There's a new paragraph, 10A2, which states once the listing agent and the seller agent give disclosures to the buyer's agent, that's when the clock starts ticking. Um, for example, the agent delivers the disclosures to the buyer's agent on Friday, fails to get them to the buyer until Monday. The time frame started on Friday. It did not start on Monday. So you as an agent have an obligation when you get those disclosures to immediately give them to your buyer because you're shortening your client's time by not giving to them immediately. And besides, what are you going to do with the disclosures? You're better off getting them out of your, off your plate and onto your buyer's plate. 10A4 um, change that said added language that the seller is um, unless the seller is exempt from providing a TDS that they're supposed to provide within the time frame that they're supposed to provide an SPQ. A lot of times people come to me and say the seller the seller's a trust, the seller is exempt from a TDS, they don't have to disclose anything. That's not true. They have to disclose what they know. They should, and where are they going to disclose it? They're going to disclose it on the SPQ. Are they, re they're going to say, I don't know anything about the property. Well, they have to disclose what they might know or what they should know. I mean, they're the owners of the property. I had somebody who had a property that, um, that was in a trust. Their mom died and they said, I don't know anything about the trust because, you know, I never lived in the property, my mom lived in the property, and now she's dead, so I can't disclose anything. And I said, well, you shame on you, you never went to see your mother once? And he said, well, no, of course I went to see my mother. I saw her every week. I, I you know, she, I would go there and she would tell me, oh, you know, the faucet's leaking. So I'd either fix the faucet or I'd find somebody to do that. Or, you know, she told me, oh, the, you know, the sprinklers aren't working right, and I'd hire somebody to do that. So by talking to your seller, you'll be amazed at how much information you might find. So don't just look at it from face value. Talk to your client, see what they know, and put it on an SBQ. Um, I mean, the condition of the property, the buyer is still supposed to conduct their inspections. Keep in mind, we've had this come up a lot. People think that the verification of property the five, within five days before the escrow closes is an inspection. It is not an inspection. It does not give the buyer any rights to bring inspectors in or to, or to argue or anything else, what it, and give them any additional time. What the verification of property is, is just to verify that the property is in the same condition it was in at, the, at or around the time that they made the offer, and to make sure that there were requests for repairs, that the repairs are done. It does not give them a right to cancel. Um, <coughs> buyer's investigation of the property. They've added some language in here because we no longer have the WPA to say that any inspection for wood, for, for wood destroying pests and organisms shall be prepared by a licensed pest control person, which shall cover the wood, you know, basically the same language that was in the WPA. Um, and it also says that it shall be separated into Section 1 and Section 2. So they basically incorporated a lot of the language from the WPA um, into this. But again, it does not say we're used to, we used to always have, well, seller is responsible for Section 1 and buyer is responsible for Section 2. We don't have that any longer. Unless you've stated in your investigation paragraphs that we've already talked about beforehand, unless you filled something in that says that, you know, the, the, they will do a, you know, a, a pest control 
um, inspection and that the seller would be responsible for any Section 1 repairs, the seller is not responsible for anything. But it becomes the buyer's responsibility. Sex offender database, I don't know why we've got flood and fire insurance in there too, it doesn't quite miss, but that's what they do. Um, paragraph 13A. As I said, you're going to see a lot of blue in here. I think everybody has a copy of this or can get a copy of it. A lot of it is just stylistic, changing words, clarifying words. So uh, paragraph 13A, uh, all they've done is define preliminary title report um, in this. And so it, it, it really isn't a, a significant change. It doesn't really change much of anything. It's just further defining what the preliminary title report is. Uh, paragraph E talks about the types of, of homeowner's title insurance and what kind of title insurance you can get. Um, if the buyer chooses a policy, they can do it. But that really is just a clarification. Uh, paragraph 14, they've just added the different paragraphs because all the paragraph numbers changed. So they had to, that's why it's all red there, because the different paragraphs changed. It provides for um, the buyer to cancel, but the buyer's already had that cancellation, right? Um, they've added the language lease documents to be assumed, and that lease documents references specifically not just leases if it's a you know a tenant type building, you know a small duplex or something like that. It basically the reason they're putting them in there is to talk about solar leases, any leases that might be under the HERO program, although most of those are outright purchases and financing for purchases. So that's what that lease, that's what that is referencing. So that the buyer is, knows all of the uh, actual liens that might be on the property because any solar lease is going to be a lien on the property. So that would, that would show up on a preliminary title report, but it also requires um, the seller and the, to give those documents to the buyer and the buyer to make sure they've read, read all of those documents. As everybody knows, um, the buyer's right to cancel is is generally during the first 17 days and now they could still cancel if they had a loan contingency within the first 21 days. Other than that, the buyer's right to cancel are pretty much ended at that point. And then the seller actually has no right to cancel unless the buyer doesn't remove their contingencies or the buyer fails to perform some contractual obligation. The language that was added, we always have questions on whether, do I have to give a notice to the buyer to perform if they don't close escrow? The answer to that is no. You give them a demand to close escrow. You don't need to give them a notice to perform. A notice, to, a notice of buyer to perform is for a removal of contingencies. So you don't have to give them a notice to perform in order for them to close escrow. But that is when the right, the seller cannot automatically cancel. If the buyer doesn't remove their contingencies, the buyer must first give them a notice to perform, and if they don't perform, then they can cancel the, the escrow. And just as an aside, the es cancellation of escrow does not require both buyer and seller to sign. It requires both signatures if there's a dispute over the deposit, which there always is a dispute over the deposit unless the buyer's canceling within the 17 days, and then we don't usually have a, dis a dispute. But if there's a cancellation after that time frame, the seller, let's say the seller does a notice to buyer to perform contingencies, buyer doesn't remove contingencies, buyer doesn't cancel, the, buyer, the seller can then issue a notice of cancellation signed by the seller, and that transaction then is canceled. What you have at issue still is the disposition of the deposit. Now, if the seller says, I'm canceling and I'm authorizing escrow to give the deposit back to the, sell the buyer, there usually isn't a problem there. But that doesn't usually happen. There's a so keep in mind that the transaction will be canceled, and you can go on to sell to another party, but the, the deposit money is still in dispute. <coughs> 14G. Is, is dealing with the deposits, and um, that's a whole other issue. I kind of just touched on that. That escrow can't just automatically, because the seller says, hey, they breached, I canceled, give me the deposit, 
escrow can't release the deposit money unless both parties agree as to what's going to happen with the deposit money or they get an order of the court. Paragraph 18 is really a defining of the scope of duty of the that the buyer and seller acknowledges what the broker's duties are. These are the same duties that are in the listing agreement. These are the same duties that are in the buyer and seller advisory. It's nothing new. It's just putting it in here so that the buyer and seller are aware of it. it looks like a lot of writing. Um, talks about uh, representation capacity of the buyers, uh, the, who represents who. This is all language that you're familiar with. It's all something you've seen before. It's just putting it in here so the buyers, basically the attorneys have decided we're getting sued on these things, <laughs> so we're going to make sure that the <laughs> buyer and seller see it one more time, um, and it's in their agreement. So it, it's not, it looks like a lot of writing, but it's nothing that you haven't seen before. All right, um, nothing really changing in the escrow instructions. I know you see some green stuff, but for the most part, it's, it's clarifying the duties and obligations and, and time frames um, that were always there, but, there's, but just directing the three-day as the default for um, getting documents around and everything else. So there, there isn't a lot changed in that. It looks like there might be, but it's more of clarification language than anything. Paragraph 21 is a new paragraph um, which, which deals with remedies for buyers for breach of contract. Um, these, are, these are remedies that, that, um, that the buyer, that the seller always had, um, but it's just setting them out there. Um, and telling them that if the if the buyer does breach the contract, um, that the liquidated damages will satisfy those breaches if the parties have signed it, and if they haven't signed it, that that the seller has whatever remedies are available under the law. So it's not anything really deep, different than what has already been there. Um, dispute resolution hasn't changed. The only thing they've added is is that they want them to go through that you can go through the Car Real Estate Mediation Center. We have a great mediation center here at SDIR, which is very cost effective because you can pay by the hour. Where most mediations like Car, you've got to pay for a half day or a full day. So I would you know recommend that everybody use SDIR down here because it's. It's just a really good system that people don't know about. And most um, of the associations actually have mediation yes. resources. So uh, because we do, Vicki, we do have people from L.A. County, Orange County, even up in Ventura and Santa Barbara County that are on with us. And, and OCAR has it. I have just found that the CAR mediation is just such a big run organization that you're much better off going with your local, with your local association. OCAR has a great one. SDR has a great one. Um, Beverly Hills is a good one. Um, you know, just go to your local association if it's if need be. Re refer your clients to the local organization. Assignment. There's some assignment language on paragraph 26. Oh, where are you? Oh, you want preservation of actions? That, that's just legal mumbo jumbo. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, love it when an never, attorney says legal mumbo jumbo. I, that's it's, just, really, it's really not going to affect any, any of our clients <laughs> for the most part. Um, assignment. We're finding a lot of people putting assignment language in their agreement. You don't have to agree to an assignment language. And if you're representing the seller, I wouldn't agree to it because you're, you're accepting an offer from a specific buyer based on that bu buyer's financial ability to buy it. If they want to assign the contract, let them come in afterwards and do an amendment to the contract with the seller's consent to assign it to somebody else. And this says the buyer shall not assign any part of their interest without having a separate consent. It says that in the agreement. But if you put in the front page or assignee, they may say, look, you already agreed to it. You don't get to consent. Putting this language in here does give the seller the right to assent to consent um, to a specific assignee. That's why they put it in here, because people were putting in the beginning of the contract or assignee. I would recommend that we just 
don't even agree to it in the beginning. And that way, if the buyer comes in later and says, look, I want to sign it, they don't have the absolute right. They have to negotiate it, whereas if they put in the contract, Mary Smith or signee, they've already set the, the bar in motion that they're going to, that they may assign it. And so then it comes down to, is the seller's consent not being um, reasonable? So I'd rather not have it in there at all. 30, they've defined what an agreement means, which is, you know, what we all knew an agreement meant. Nothing else really. That should be it. All right, very good. Well, I appreciate everybody taking time out of your busy schedule. Forgive me, this was the very first one that we've done. Uh, we are, as we get more information and as we continue to develop tutorials and handouts that you can use, um, we will put that out for you. We uh, would encourage you to join um, as many of these webinars as possible. Uh, we will have both uh, Mar Martha Mosier and Stella Ling host uh, these webinars as well. Um, so sometimes it's good just to hear different things from our different attorneys that will help you. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you taking time through this and we'll uh, talk to everybody really soon. Thank you, Vicki. I appreciate and it. Should, we, it should be noted I only ran 10 minutes over. Yeah, it's well noted. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Have okay, a great, great day. Okay, bye-bye.